G'day folks, ZD here. The other day I went on a whirlwind journey to LA, subjecting myself to over 40 hours of travel in just a four day period. But one of the only things that you could convince me to subject myself to such torture for, Path of Exile 2. Jokes aside, shout out to GGG for covering flights and accommodation for us for this event. It definitely wouldn't have been financially feasible otherwise, and I was super excited to get a proper and less restricted hands-on with Path of Exile 2, and a chance to see the rather insane metamorphosis it's undergone in the months since ExileCon. This first video will be an overview of what we saw and my overall review. I'll follow up with some deeper dives in the coming days. For now, I want to help answer your questions on whether this game will be worth the wait. So after sleeping through my alarm due to jet lag, I skipped breakfast and raced to the event, thankfully still arriving on time. First up was a presentation with Jonathan on the mic and Octavian on the drums, I mean PC, as they went over the new Ranger and some other gameplay changes. They ended with an early teaser of a hilarious new skill to summon and ride a rower mount complete with the ability to fight from it while riding around. Yeah, I didn't expect that one, safe to say. The Great Khan will be very pleased that we're getting Mongol Horse Archer builds, and I can't wait to show off my Cantabrian Circle tactics. Jokes aside, I'm actually a bit unsure about how to feel about mounts for now in Path of Exile. Certainly very cute, but I'd need some hands-on when it's a bit further along to say for sure. These were not available yet at the event. Either way, I just hope that we get a Lance Rower Charge skill with the Spears. I mean, oh, what's the point otherwise? Another big thing revealed was the new ability to raise a shield for a directional guaranteed block. This will be somewhat balanced by a limited amount of blocking that you can do before a bar fills up and you get stunned out of your block. Also, some boss attacks and things like ground effects aren't going to be blockable, which makes sense. But, all the same, this seems insanely powerful. Unfortunately, I didn't get a chance to try it out as I focused all my time on the Ranger. Though now that I think about it, I could have like bought a shield from the vendor to just test it. Uh, I keep thinking of things I wish I'd tried. But by all accounts, the block is effective and quick to use, so I see this being extremely powerful in the hands of skilled players in boss fights. Whip it up for a certain attack that you know you can block, and then dodge roll or sidestep the others while keeping up the attack. It actually sounds really cool, to the point where I really struggled between running Ranger or Warrior at this event, so it was a tough choice. I love shields in general in RPGs, and they're always a little bit underutilized I feel, so it's awesome to see that they'll be having a bigger gameplay impact. There's even the potential of using the auto weapon swap system to like whip out a shield to use a defensive skill, and then automatically swap back to your bow or whatever you're dealing damage with. I'm definitely more than a little intrigued by this concept. And by the way, how awesome does this B-roll footage look? I especially like what looks like a molten shell block that explodes in retaliation, and the awesome looking armor and the chunky shield look incredible. The explosive war cry, the uppercuts with the mace, oh, it all just looks so flawless. I'm dying it looks so good. So anyway, after the Jonathan talk, we got a solid, I want to say four hours with the game. But I didn't actually look at my clock because I didn't want to waste even the single second it would take me to glance at my phone. <laughs> I was all in. <laughs> we were able to take Warrior, Sorceress or Ranger through with no restrictions from level 1 to whatever we got up to through Acts 1 and 2. And we were able to record our experience so that you'll see some examples of my run on Ranger in this video. I really wanted to try out the other classes too, but we had to reset our account in order to take a new class, so I decided to stick with the Ranger to deep dive as much as I could on the new movement, the controls, and I just love me some bow action. I don't regret my choice, because I really ended up enjoying the Ranger, but I also wish I just had like another two days to play the other classes as well. Now I actually only ended up getting a bit of the way into Act 2 by the end, which is a bit crazy as it's about three hours of footage, but Act 1 was seriously meaty. Easy to spend a few hours there, especially as most bosses take at least an attempt or two. Unfortunately though, I did also have a few crashes and a progression bug at one point which held me up for the better part of an hour, so I didn't quite make it as far as I would have liked. This is unfortunate, but these things happen and it's kind of the cost of getting an early hands-on like this. Naturally, technical issues are frustrating, but despite them, I overall just had a very good time. I was entranced by the zones, the character progression, the enemies, the ranger gameplay in general, and most of all, the bosses. The boss fights are brutal, but for the most part they feel fair. 
For example, the Devourer is really tough and I died a few times for sure to it, but once you learn to either use the body as cover or dodge roll through the breath rather than with it or away, it starts to actually kind of click and the fight comes together. Even the minor zone bosses scattered around have designs and mechanical interest levels that blows any Path of Exile 1 map boss away. The pinnacle of Path of Exile 1 boss fight designs is kind of the bar they seem to be aiming for here it seems, especially for the act bosses. Like if they release the PoE 2 Act 1 boss fight as a new pinnacle endgame boss in PoE 1, it would not feel out of place. Like it could be an endgame boss. I love good, tense, and exhilarating boss fights, so I'm super happy with the frequency and quality of what we're getting here in terms of boss fights. Now that all said, while Path of Exile veterans seem to have a challenging and great time with the bosses, there was some other journalists and whatnot there that have a bit less Path of Exile experience. And this isn't a slight against them in any way, they represent most gamers who will give PoE 2 a try. And well, some of them really struggled. So there's definitely a concern there that there's a bit of a barrier to entry even as early as Act 1, when Path of Exile 2 really wants to be pulling in some new players I think. I don't know how they're going to resolve this but I do plan on asking Jonathan what he thinks in the Q&A and I'll share that later. I do have one idea for Flas, for example that I think could help some of these players which I'll talk about later potentially as well. But for now mostly I'll speak to my experience as someone who's been playing Path of Exile for you know a decade. So more on bosses because this is really the highlight for me. The final boss of Act 1, and spoiler warning obviously, the Iron Count. This guy was a real spicy boss. Now I didn't focus too much on the story because I didn't really want to like spoil that too much for myself just yet. Just wanted to focus on that gameplay, but my understanding is that this is the guy who sentences you to death, right? So it's a pretty cool like final Act 1 boss I think. And interesting that we're potentially kind of tying that up a little bit at the start. That's like, it's the intro to the rest of the story I think, which is a good one. You know, it's a classic recall to Path of Exile 1's original story of chasing down Dominus. So my first attempt at this guy went poorly as he stayed on top of me quite effectively with his light attacks causing me some real issues. I really like the way he moves around with those attacks. I went back to town before my second attempt for a quick bow upgrade just to help out a little tiny bit and I got a better handle on his regular attacks this time around. That said, I still have some very close calls in this first section of the fight. He also has a wolf form that he'll transition to a little bit later on with some pretty awesome aesthetics. It looks really sick. And it has some very meaty attacks as well, including this teleport slam that I'm pretty sure I get hit by every single time. One thing I really like here is that the difficulty is tuned that most things don't necessarily just outright one-shot you, but they get pretty close. What that means is that you have to use a flask to recover, right? Before the next thing finishes you off. With this design, if you aren't doing well, the boss continually attritions you and then it's one of the follow-up attacks that eventually get you. I like that design. I think that's the thing that contributes to a lot of the boss fights feeling very hard but fair. Now I managed this attrition system pretty well though because as the ranger I had some pretty powerful flask charge regeneration passives that were possibly a bit too powerful. So I didn't have to clutch a town portal in order to refill my flask for example. But I like where they're going with this. The better you do, the less pressure on your flasks, and the less need for that risky town portal, which takes quite a lot of time to do and leaves you very vulnerable during. Still in some of the earlier boss fights where I did manage to pull off that clutch portal, it was kind of tense and exciting. Keep in mind that bosses full reset if you die here, so you can't just kind of get a free pass and circumvent a boss fight by corpse diving them. You really do actually have to learn the fight, or go away and get stronger and then come back later. This is of course great for offering a very solid challenge that is very rewarding when you finally do manage to defeat it, but it will potentially contribute to some of those people who are maybe a bit less experienced getting frustrated in these fights if they don't quite get the mechanics to click or if their build is a bit too weak overall. So in this fight I didn't have a good way to stun or freeze yet on the bosses. The escape shot can freeze but it requires you to consistently land a few hits in a row to pull off a freeze and that wasn't quite viable for me here. It's pretty close range and a bit hard to land on quicker targets. I did use it to good effect in some of the earlier boss fights but not quite here. That said there are options like a skill that I get later on that electrocutes enemies so these effects can be a pretty big thing in fights. I'll show you a later boss fight after this as an example but for the iron count I just had to send it the old fashioned way. At about the halfway point he mutates into a man-wolf hybrid, betrayed by his partner. The fight changes completely here. 
the fog phase especially gave me some trouble. But like I said, it's bound to attrition you and not just outright one-shot you. And if I'm being brutally honest with myself, if not for that flash charge generation I'd built for, I'd have been in real trouble here. The ranger's mobility while attacking was really fun in this fight, but I definitely need more practice to reliably do it without those extra flask uses. By the end of the fight, my heart was racing, my hands shaky, and I noticed I'd been holding my breath at the end, so I had a pretty big exhale of elation when I defeated the boss. And when I saw that unique drop, I actually couldn't stifle a little cheer. It might sound a little lame to some of you, I'm sure, you know, feeling feelings and whatnot, but the game elicited a pretty strong adrenaline and dopamine response in me, and that's just like not happening all that often these days, especially not from Act 1 bosses, of all things. I was actually trying to plug my hard drive in to transfer footage after and I was kind of struggling a bit from the shaky hands. <laughs> if they could get that feeling from us for each act boss in this campaign, at least the first time through, then GGG have something special on their hands. I don't think I can actually really remember feeling that in Pee-wee's one campaign for quite some time. Maybe like when they first released Katava or something. Overall a really fun and scary and cool and well balanced fight. Super impressive for this early before release. So I mentioned the importance of effects that like stun, stagger, or freeze or otherwise crowd controlled bosses. And you can see that in action here with the electrocute skill that I get my hands on later. You leap over a target, impaling them with a conductive rod, and then when you hit it with lightning damage, it builds up an electrocute CC. It's very fun and powerful and combined with boss staggers you can buy yourself time for big combos like I was using Sniper's Mark to get a Frenzy Charge and then Barrage Lightning Arrow for some big damage but if you're in a worry you might build up like a big slam combo or something like that. Sometimes though the real threat is those normal monsters and this fight here is a little bit cheap at the end. <laughs> The moment to moment gameplay in Path of Exile 2 is very spicy overall. The combination of how the flask system has changed, how skills all work quite differently and are impactful at different times, and the general tuning of monsters all mean that like every engagement matters. Normal monsters can take you down pretty quick and poor engagements at the very least burn some flask charges, which actually has that attrition effect. I'll do a deeper dive into Flask in a later video, but they're honing in on something important here where the fights between bosses actually seem to matter as well. I certainly think you're going to be getting strong enough to feel like you're really owning monsters, but when you get to that point, you're actually going to feel like you have to kind of fight for it a bit and not that monsters are just by default something that explode. I think that's really important in the end for having a very solid sense of progression, right? Like your build will feel much more rewarding if you went from just getting owned by regular monsters to starting to devastate them. That's what gives you a real big sense of progression in the end. Not just that you got faster and more explodey than you were at the beginning, right? I think the life changes play a role here too. There's no life on the passive tree now, which means everyone has a bit of a more consistent life pool to com compared to monster damage. And you can't easily passive spec to make the monsters just straight up non-threatening, at least not in the early stages. Any gear you managed to find that had life or a bit of ES definitely felt like it had a bit of an impact, that's for sure. Especially as you started to get strong enough where some things that stunned you and took away half of your life before get down to a third or something and don't really stun you consistently anymore. I actually ended up finding the most impactful thing was having decent evasion gear though. When I found later on some nicer rare gear that wasn't evasion based and switched into it, I did really notice that loss of the evasion. I think just naturally when monsters are hitting so hard, something that completely mitigates that damage even if it's a bit inconsistent, definitely like you feel it, you notice it triggering effectively, you notice that you evaded stuff. Interestingly, strength as an attribute did seem to give like one life per point, which is a pretty major boost. So I imagine characters like the warrior and the like that will naturally have a bit higher strength will feel quite a bit beefier. 
Though by all accounts from what I'd heard from warrior players, without some good gear, normal monsters could still mess you up. The passive tree is very much a prototype for now and they said not to focus on the nodes for example too much as it's really not ready for public consumption yet, but it did feel nice to only be thinking of how I wanted to scale damage or what useful utility I wanted to get from the tree instead of just looking to chain life nodes right as a mandatory checkbox. It's way too early to speak to this in much detail but that seems to be what they're going for and I already noticed that. Now WASD movement and attack while moving were a big part of the range of gameplay and a huge impact on how it felt as a class. I think I'll do a deeper dive on this later but for now let's say I went in as a skeptic but I ended up playing the whole event in WASD just testing click to move to see how it works. You can still attack while moving without WASD, your character just keeps walking based on the previous movement click command while you attack with another button. But honestly, that was a bigger change to adapt to as a longtime Pee Wee player than simply just embracing the WASD and adapting to the completely new scheme. Overall, WASD felt really good and fun on the Ranger. I can see maybe the more static classes like Warrior could feel a bit better still on click to move, but I loved Ranger on the Wasid controls. It felt fluid, fast, and really like a whole different playstyle compared to what I've played in the past. It's definitely the most Ranger that the Ranger has ever felt. Stalking werewolves in the woods and trying to sidestep attacks or backpedal while continuously sending arrows back was super cool. Jonathan mentioned trying to evoke that Legolas fantasy with the ranger, and while I wasn't skateboarding any shields downstairs, my gameplay in Act 2 definitely started to feel like that what they were going for with that fantasy. It feels agile, and the physical act of playing the class really leans into that. I'm actually really curious to try the mercenary now, as the crossbows and bows seem like they're going to feel quite different, with the crossbows being a bit more like instant snappy and explosive, and then the bows being a bit more fluid. I just bet the Merc is going to be a blast with this movement and control style with those burstier skills. Another big takeaway I have from this event is how the overall progression feels. Gearing, skills, and just the general power progression of your character. This is because we actually got this time to build characters. We had enough time and we could spend passives and we started from level 1. The previous Exilecon demos were pre-built characters and that's really missing half the point about what these games are. Character builders, right? So it was awesome to finally get into the meat on character building. Now we had limited skill options and only the first two acts to play around in, but I actually think we got a really good picture of what they're going for here. Firstly, the skills. I definitely felt the lack of skill options early on, and the first hour or so had the issue of incentivizing default attacks, which I don't necessarily think is a great idea. Lighting Arrow actually did less single target than a default attack despite costing mana, so I think we were like missing a Burning Arrow skill or something like that in that first stretch. But once I started getting a few more skills, like for example the Lightning Rods that Lightning Arrow could chain to, that would make it an actual decent single target. And once I get more uncut gems and things to play around with and had some support gems dropping, things started really coming together. It's a somewhat slow and steady progress in the evolution of your character's skill package where you get a pretty good chance to play with each new addition, and that gives you a real like feeling of the evolution of your build over time, I think. So I like that part of the progression for sure. I just think maybe that very early portion could be a little bit more interesting, where you have two skills instead of one for that first stretch of gameplay. I mostly stuck with a lightning build, but I incorporated the poison burst skill for some bonus damage while I moved around. It was pretty good on some of the energy shield monsters in the graveyards as well. The poison stuff looks very cool in general, but I ended up loving the lightning build. I really liked the gearing side of things on character progression. The amount of loot felt really bang on for what I want to see from the game, where you're getting like one or two rares from a boss and that feels like a pretty big win, and those rares have a decent impact when they're right for you. It also felt cute how jewelry is quite rare and valuable, I always liked that in Diablo 2. I don't know why, it just makes it feel a bit more special. Getting a nice red ring or amulet is going to feel really good and probably be a good character upgrade for a while. Crafting resources are certainly limited, but definitely exist. You know, I got several Alks and a handful of transmutes through the run that I played. That said, I felt that there should be more augments and regals dropping. I might have just got particularly unlucky in that regard, but those give you those real satisfying upgrade slams, and I think a few more of those through the campaign would be nice. Maybe they don't start kicking in until the later acts, perhaps. Magic and rare items seem to vendor for a good amount of gold. 
four or five rare sales usually would give you enough gold to upgrade something from the vendor with one of their pre-rolled items that they have. These could be really impactful if it's like a better weapon, the next tier of bow for example with a damage mod or some move speed boots. You're also torn between the decision to vendor items for gold or actually disenchant them for transmute and alchemy shards. It takes 20 rares in the early game to give you an alk, so no one was really managing to do that in the demo time I don't think, but a few transmutes were doable. I think overall gold felt like the better deal, especially for rare items, but it's interesting to have the choice. I like that if you need a specific base and want an alk for it, you can work towards that. Obviously it's pretty early and it's hard to put my finger on exactly why, but I really liked the gearing overall. Everything felt like it mattered and I was excited when something dropped. Getting some sweet movement speed boots definitely made a huge difference with the attack while moving. All of a sudden my gameplay changes from a lot of like not quite being able to kite or sidestep enemies while shooting to being able to do that, right? And that's a big deal, like that's a big kind of break point in terms of your character's mobility and power. I'll have to reflect on the gearing a bit more I think to figure out why it lands so well, but overall it felt really good. So to sum up a bit and answer my initial question perhaps about whether Path of Exile 2 is going to be worth your waiting for it. During this play session I had, you know, some torn feelings, right? I felt a mixture of anxiety that I wouldn't be able to get the footage that I wanted, frustration over the technical issues that came up, and then like fear of missing out FOMO over whether I should also be recording the other classes or stick with what I chose, right? It's a nasty and potent little cocktail, that mix of concerns. Somewhat distracting while I was just trying to sink in and enjoy such an event. After all, Path of Exile is a game and a hobby for me, but it's also my livelihood. But the more I reflect on it, looking back now, I realize just how much I enjoyed it despite those distractions. And how strong the desire is to play more right now. <laughs> like really, right now. I'm seriously wondering if GGG would let me come into the office if I flew over to New Zealand in like a month or so. Probably not very feasible, but ooh, I'd love to. Pee 2 has been a long wait for us, hasn't it? And the news of a delayed beta is unsurprising, but still a pretty rough blow. Add to that how big the changes are to the core gameplay, control schemes and things like that. And this is to a formula that many of us love in Path of Exile 1, right? Like you're messing with perfection to some of us. In the end, I don't think it's weird for you to be questioning whether Path of Exile 2 is worth the wait, or even necessarily if you want it more than Path of Exile 1 updates. I'll tell you something though. After this event, I feel that Path of Exile 2 has become more worth the hype. More worth the wait than it was after ExileCon 1, and even ExileCon 2. Even with the delays. It's gone from a simple refresh of Path of Exile 1's visuals and a new campaign to a proper evolution that's looking like it might actually achieve a somewhat impossible balance. I'm talking a game that calls back to the magic of Path of Exile 1's very early days of a scary, tense crawl through a hostile world while still managing to look and feel like a modern action game. One with meaningful, impactful moment-to-moment -moment combat that still feels fast-paced, a game that looks slow but isn't, because every action and monster counts. I'm more hyped than ever walking away from this event. If I had to temper your expectations on anything, it's this. Some of you play Path of Exile 1 to relax, to blow up monsters and chill, right? I don't know that Path of Exile 2 will be what you're looking for if that's the case. PoE 2 was tense, it was challenging and sometimes even a little exhausting. It's much more rewarding because of it to be sure, but I'm definitely thinking that some of you may end up preferring PoE 1 for this reason. I get it for sure. You would want to get on and blow things up, sure. But for me, and many of you too I'm sure, the moments I love in Path of Exile 1 the most is when it scares the crap out of me. When I struggle and struggle to finally beat that uber boss, when I need to take a little bit of a break after playing to calm myself down because I felt something. That's what I love in Path of Exile 1, and that's what Path of Exile 2 is doubling down on, I think. So anyway folks, I hope you found this interesting. Be sure to drop me a sub if you want to catch some of my follow-up content on my Path of Exile 2 experiences. That's it for now, I'm Ziggy D, and thanks for watching.